This is a René Fonseca, Quantum Dots and Sun is the title, and, uh, and there are paper, joint papers with uh, a lot of Italian colleagues, so also thanks to Irene for this kind of co collaboration. Thanks, and uh, boa palestra. Thank you, Luke, too. Actually, I realized that they are all Italian, but uh, myself and Barbara. So, um, I'd like to start by thanking the organizers for giving me the opportunity to say a few words um, about uh, the, the way that my work has been influenced by, by the Georgies. So a lot has been said here, and I'll probably repeat a lot of what has been said before, but allow me to share with you some of my memories uh, of the Georgie. So I met the Georgie um, sometime in the mid-80s, and I've been trying to remember uh, if it was in Cortona, if it was at Villa Madruso in Trento, and many of you who are my age or older uh, probably remember those meetings at uh, Villa Madruso, or maybe here at Pisa, I don't remember. Um, what I do remember is that the Georgie always with his uh, scientific generosity and wisdom that would spill over the younger generation, and back then I was part of that generation, um, somehow you would always find the time to, to talk with me, to have some conversations with me. Now, these conversations, of course, were basically monologues, uh, and uh, he would teach me mathematics. Uh, he would start in English, he will uh, fast transition to French, and he would end up with a few echoes in Italian. And um, at that time, uh, uh, you know, it was uh, uh, a bit um, complicated for me to understand everything he wanted to say. Um, then uh, later on, I met him several times in Pisa, so he would invite me to his office, and uh, um, as, as Aim said yesterday, it was, uh, at least to me, a bit intimidating. It was dark, uh, it had all this wood, there were lots of students. Uh, and everybody was drinking his words, uh, and, um, and so uh, this was at a time where there was intense interest in uh, single perturbation problems, like, uh, you know, can heal you type of problems, uh, also um, uh, free discontinuity problems, like Mumford Chat type of problems, and then of course there was all the geometrical measure theory intersecting with calculus variations, and of course gamma convergence, minimizing movements, and, and so on. So it was really fascinating. And so, so, so we would start this conversation in his office, uh, and in later years, when he was sick with, with cancer, he would not, we would not go to the Mensa, we would go to a pizzeria somewhere behind the school Normale, where he was very well known. Um, and the conversation would continue there uh, until nap time. And uh, so then he would go to take his nap. Um, so so it, uh, it's really a privilege to, to have known uh, the Georgies, a, a deep thinker, and really an extraordinary man. So um, I hope that today in the talk that I'm going to deliver next, uh, you will see uh, the George's influence. And indeed, minimizing movements in particular, it's going to be central to what I'm going to talk. So and with this, let me move to my talk. So um, this is work, uh, again, with many of you here. Uh, and. Um, and so uh, the story goes into three phases, and, uh, and it's exactly the, 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 the route we took in trying to understand these problems. Uh, and it starts with uh, the understanding of quantum dots, and then um, we'll move to surface diffusion uh, of, these, uh, of these islands, of these formations. And, and then we will end up with a very recent work uh, that we don't know much about. We already have some results, and, um, but I, I'll, I'll hope to uh, tell you something about it. So, um, so, so this whole story started with, uh, uh, with Sukirka. Well, we, some of you are familiar with Mullen Sukirka Law, so that's that Sukirka, who's uh, our colleague at the CMU. He lives down the hall from us. 
and he 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 was uh, uh, telling me about this this uh, phenomena in epitaxial deposition, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about that. And of course, again, also like as uh, Imbrizi said yesterday, well, physicists and engineers they know everything. So 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 he knew already what was the phenomena, but he was puzzled in trying to understand why rigorously that really happened. So so. Let me tell you a little bit how the story starts. So you have um, a substrate of a certain um, crystalline structure, so, so it has a crystalline lattice, and say, for example, silicon, and you're going to deposit on that a thin film, so a few layers of atoms of, of, uh, of, of a film which is not the same, so for example, silicon germanium. So the crystalline lattice is not quite the same, uh, and uh, until you reach a, a critical thickness of the film, they are not very happy living together because you have stresses developing at the interface. But, um, but you know, um, uh, surface area uh, dominates, and so because you have just a very thick volume of uh, thin volume of, of film, so, so so it stays flat, right? To minimize the surface. Um, as you build up this film more and more elastic energy is developing and stresses are developing and so at some point something has to give. And, and, and that's a, proto, a prototype example of a competition between bulk energy forming versus surface energy, right? The film wants to stay flat, yeah, but then you have all that energy uh, building there. And so what happens is that the film is no longer flat and starts developing these islands or quantum dots. Quantum because they're very small. Um, and, so, uh, and so that's basically uh, what, what happens. Uh, and that's, uh, say, a summary of what I just said. And so many questions then surface. One of them is, well, um, and this again is something which is uh, observed in, the, in experiments uh, and uh, in the lab, that, um, that actually when you relax the system, it turns out that, um, that it looks like the substrate is exposed between islands. However, energetically, that's not what it works. Uh, and what works is that there's like a thin uh, a layer of film that stays between the islands. We call that wetting, so it's kind of wet. So, so question, can you actually validate that? That that's actually what the system wants to do. That was the first question we were asked. And the second one is, uh, well, uh, these, these islands tend to, to meet the substrate um, at a very nice and smooth um, angle, actually what they call zero contact angle. So if you wish, what you're talking about here is basically some type of a free discontinuity problem that, um, has the advantage that you're starting already with a graph, say, as opposed to Manfred Cha. You already know it's a graph. And so the zero contact angle in our language is, well, can you prove that it's better than Lipschitz, right? Can you prove, because Lipschitz, okay, you'd have an angle. So is it C1 alpha or something like that? Okay, so again, those are very simple cartoons. So this is a typical migration of the atoms and to form the quantum dots. Again, very naive cartoon. You have the substrate living here, you have the film living there, and the graph of the film is y equal to h of x. So that would be a slice of, of that. Um, so so um, uh, again, there are many, many, uh, uh, many regimes. We are going to talk about basically the stransky krasanov growth mode, which again involves the wetting phenomenon. Okay, so um, now why, why do we care? Well, we care because we don't want to get rid of quantum dots. Quantum dots are very important, and the reason, one of the reasons why you, you can have a very thin MEC air is because you have quantum dots in there, right? So it's all, all the, the hardware is, uh, involves quantum dots. But the point is that um, can you tell us where to, uh, to, um, to, to, to form these dots uh, to optimize performance? Um, in particular, uh, uh, lack of overheating, one and two, for example. Uh, can you also manipulate the shapes? Uh, quantum dots have different shapes, and that was actually work with uh, 
uh, Aldo Pratelli here and Barbara Ziknagel, and I will touch that briefly. Uh, and basically, their shapes vary. Again, this is something which has been established. IBM, for example, they know that, and I'll show you some cartoons from IBM, where uh, these shapes so evolve uh, uh, with, uh, with the volume. They start as pyramids, that they become domes, and etc. Okay, again, can you, uh, is there a theorem that you can prove? So, uh, and again, uh, for example, right now in 3D printing, and, uh, and we know that this is becoming uh, very, very important uh, in applications, again, the, the quantum dots play an important role there. Okay, so, um, Again, there's, there's quite a bit of literature uh, on continuum models for epitaxy. Uh, and epitaxy, again, is this way of deposing the film over the, the substrate. Uh, and uh, we were in particular uh, um, uh, inspired by the work of Spencer and Tersoff. Tersoff is, is a researcher at IBM, and he was the one that also brought us some of these questions. So uh, let me start with a very simple, um, a simple uh, um, a description of the problem here. And, and to simplify matters, I will assume that uh, you are working on the pl on, on in R2. So imagine that that this is a cross section of your eye of, of your of your film. So, so the substrate lives here, the film lives over there in omega H. That's the profile of the film. And suppose that it's uh, basically self-similar away from the screen. That's actually uh, not, not physical because these islands are not self-similar uh, and you should not work on the plane. Uh, we did first work on the plane. Uh, then it took us quite a while to find out how to solve the problem in 3D, which is the real uh, context, and it's been done, so those are available. Um, and and th that work is published. So, um, okay, so, so these are all very small uh, deformations, so U is going to be the displacement, linear elasticity. So you talk, uh, so you, you, you work with a symmetrized gradient, that's your typical energy density for linear elasticity. C here is a positive definite fourth order tensor. And you're going to penalize these, uh, the surface, again, think about the muffer check kind of problem, with uh, 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 surface energy density, which no, usually it's an isotropic. It does depend on the normal. Um, for more of what I'm going to say, it really makes no difference whether it's an isotropic or not. It will when we'll uh, talk about the diffusion. When we we'll let these things evolve by surface diffusion, then yes, the isotropy of the surface energy density will play a role. Now, um, there, are, there are many ways in which you can emulate this mismatch between the crystalline structure on the film and the one on the substrate. One, for example, is to say, look, uh, the natural state here um, on, on, on the film is, um, is, say, a shear. That's where the film is more comfortable, while it's the identity in the substrate, so basically do nothing. Uh, and then you'll have a jump between uh, the, the two natural states here, which I'll, I'll show you with an energy how that looks like. The other way is to anchor uh, with a Dirichlet uh, condition uh, the film uh, uh, here on, on, the, on the interface, so that's y equal to zero. Uh, and uh, basically, it's your shear, right? You're shearing it in that direction. E zero is uh, basically the amplitude of the mismatch. If E zero was one, uh, you would have basically no mismatch. The larger E0 is, of course, the, 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 the larger is the amplitude of the mismatch. I'm going to assume also for simplicity that I work in a band and that I have periodicity um, on the lateral, and that's actually not, not too far-fetched, and I'll come back to that later on to justify the periodicity. Actually, I don't have a justification, but, but I'll, I'll tell you why we think that's the right thing to do. Okay, so... Um, so, so that's your energy, right? So bulk energy in omega H uh, plus uh, surface energy there. You have two unknowns here because you don't know what is the profile H. And then once you have the profile H, of course, you don't know what is the optimal displacement U, which minimizes the energy. So you have two things moving on you. Um, OK, so there it is. So again, some references for, this, uh, for energies of this type. As far as we know, 
our work uh, is the first one that combines both elasticity and surface energy uh, density, again, depending on the normal. Uh, as I said, so the natural state is zero, will be zero for y less than zero, so substrate means do nothing. Uh, displacement zero is, is where you want to be, while uh, on the film uh, it's sheared in the, in the one zero direction. And so, uh, and so this is the type of energy you should consider, right? It jumps across the interface. Um, now, uh, here I'm going to consider that I have the same uh, uh, tensor C for the film and for the substrate, i.e. the same material properties. It's not quite right, although in most experiments that you see, they actually use the same because it's not that, that far off. Uh, uh, say, in gallium arsenide over arsenide, it's not that far, or for example, silicon germanium over germanium, it's not that far, but it may make a difference. And again, when I'll talk about regularity, I think that considering two different answers, genuinely two different answers, on the film and on the substrate, may explain some issues we have in regularity. Okay, so, so that's your energy here. And uh, now, uh, again, if you jump abruptly from the field to the substrate, that's very hard to implement. So normally what you do is you take a, a thin layer, say, uh, with delta across the interface, and you use your preferred, uh, I don't know, hyperbolic tangent, something to go smoothly from one to the other. So you smooth it out, but that's not a big deal. Okay, that's, that's not a big deal. Okay, so... Um, uh, let's consider two regimes. For, for, to, to simplify, let me assume for now that I'm not depending on the normal, but I depend on position, although the analysis could be carried out exactly the same, basically. Uh, and uh, let me go back here, and my energy, not, let me assume that my energy density, surface energy density, has just two values. One if I'm on the film, another one if I'm on the substrate. So if the substrate is exposed, it's, well, it's a value, uh, which is this one, and that's uh, another one up there. So you have two regimes, right? And it turns out that in the materials that we are interested, you, uh, the regime that actually um, we study is this one. And, and, and indeed, when you relax the energy, right? Take your, which is basically gamma convergence, right? Except you just have one functional, but it's gamma convergence. Do gamma convergence with one functional, you get the relaxation energy. And it turns out that um, elastic energy stays the same, but now surface energy reduces to just the length, uh, and then everywhere you take the surface energy of the film, wetting. So that means that even if the substrate seems to be exposed to you, actually you have the energy of the film everywhere, throughout, and the other one disappeared. So again, it's, uh, it's more favorable to cover the, the substrate with, uh, and if it has a uh, layer of, of uh, atoms, then just leave it um, exposed. Okay, so uh, this you can find, so, so this is work that has been uh, published. Uh, and, um, and then, and then we, we, we want to look at regularity. Remember there's this question of the zero contact angle, that these, uh, these structures, these dots, um, uh, meet smoothly the substrate. So again, you want a very nice uh, regularity result. So we do that. And, um, and then, so we worked, we worked very hard, and we proved that the, uh, for minimizers, I mean, it matches our pairs. It's a, it's, it's, it's a profile, and it's the corresponding displacement. Uh, they, w the first result actually was that, well, it was basically Lipschitz, um, except for a finite number, a finite number of cracks uh, or cusps, so things that look like this. Oops. Uh, this is a cusp. Um, and, and you could have like vertical slopes, and I don't have a, 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 a cut here, but a cut would be like if you have a nice smooth curve, or it's, it's like if these two lips uh, coincide, right? If, if, they, if they coalesce, then you have them, but then you have the memory that there was a cut in there. Well, so it's lip sheet, so it's still not zero contact angle, but you're getting there. Uh, and then we worked very hard to remove these cusps and, uh, and vertical slopes and all that. Uh, we could prove that uh, 
Look, if they exist, they are finitely many. So you don't have a complete failure of your system, like a, uh, an accumulation point of these things, say, for example, near the boundary. Uh, we know there are finitely many if they exist, but we could not get rid of them. And we're working very hard. And this was, uh, uh, actually, I think it was a meeting somewhere in Italy. And I was discussing this with a colleague of ours, Bob Kahn. Uh, and Bob said, oh, wait, wait, wait. Don't, don't, don't try harder, because actually those things do exist. And so, and so he pointed us, uh, Nicola and uh, Max and others, to this paper uh, which had come out in, um, I think, uh, uh, physical letters or something like that, where for silicon 0.6, germanium 0.4, they do see these cusps and, and cats. So we were very happy. We, we left it there. Now, what we don't know yet is to prove their onset. So, so we know we cannot get rid of them, which is good because they exist, but we don't have a theorem that says, and under these circumstances, yes, the right profile is one that has that. And this is where I think that maybe considering two different material tensors, Cs, may actually explain the formation of, of this. Okay, so, um, so there it is. Uh, and uh, so then, okay, we could, we've got Lipschitz, we want to do better, right? So that takes us to, uh, so that's what it is. Uh, so to do better, you, you need to, um, you need to go, well, we need to go, we, we did go to, to a subclass that we know how to manipulate better. So linearly uh, isotropic materials, there we know that the energy looks like, uh, like so. Uh, lambda and mu are the usual Lyme moduli with the usual conditions to have ellipticity, right, cursivity, euler uh, Lagrange system of equations. And again, remember that the singular part is these cusps or cuts. Uh, we also know that it's at most finite. And indeed, we could prove in this case that away from these finitely many uh, points, um, the profile is really very nice. Is C1 alpha. So that was what you want. So you have your zero contact angle. OK, um, so, so, so another thing I'm going to go very briefly over this, which was to try to understand the evolution of these shapes with the volume fraction of film. Again, you start as flat, and then you become a pyramid, and then you become a dome, etc. This was work with uh, Aldo um, Patelli and Barbara Zicknagel. And, and so, so there's a whole hierarchy of these shapes, which again, it's very well understood uh, in particular uh, at IBM. And uh, so other papers which are related to this. Uh, and, and I may have not um, written down here all the references, so please forgive me if I did not quote you. Uh, and basically, let me just go really quick here. But basically, what we, we prove, we, we basically validate that you, you, you have a hierarchy that looks like this, uh, depending on the volume fraction. In particular, we could show that it starts immediately as, as a pyramid, which is actually asymmetric. There's also another twist in our problem, but I want to go about that. OK, so so much for the quasi-static regime. And now, um, OK, now, now let, let's, let's let these things evolve. Uh, surface diffusion, right? So, so, so you have uh, normal velocity here, uh, basically proportional to the Laplace Beltrami operator. Um, mu here is the chemical potential, so um, it's the very first variation of the energy, uh, right? You have to work with the uh, tangential divergence uh, of of the anisotropic energy, and here, uh, uh, having the surface energy depending on the normal does. Uh, play a role. Remember, the whole reason why this thing is happening is because you have crystalline structures. So orientations do matter. Otherwise, this would not go anywhere, right? It would stay put. So that's your, that's your, uh, that's your equation. But this can be um, ill-posed. It can be horribly backward parabolic, because if psi has a lot of anisotropy, uh, you, may have, um, you, know, you may have that this derivative is negative at some directions, and so, uh, and so uh, you, you have a problem. Uh, now, you do what uh, the giants do, so go back to John Kahn and others, and what you do is you go there, you add a small perturbation involving uh, mean curvature. Uh, now, 
actually, I should say that if you look again at the work of John Kahn and Kahn and Taylor and others, they do uh, have p equal to 2, so mean curvature square. We can do p equal to 2 on the plane, but the plane is not physically re uh, reasonable, as I mentioned to you. In R3, we need p bigger than 2. It just a technicality, but we don't know how to get rid of that. And I'll tell you why. It's a, it's a question of Sobolev embedding theorem. So, uh, but so may, maybe there's a way of going around that. Okay, so, so but now you make that perturbation there. Take again the first variation. The new terms you pick up are these, and now life is good. Although, um, think about this. Uh, it's, it's, it's good, but it's a bit nasty. Because you see two derivatives there, two derivatives there, plus mean curvature, two derivatives. So it's, uh, it's, it's a high order parabolic equation. OK, there it is. Now, in 2D, yes, we can do with curvature square. Uh, that's what you get. Uh, again, you have in here uh, several references for, the, for, for, for this work. Uh, why do we need p bigger than 2 uh, in R3? Well, again, it's just because it's a Sobolev embedding theorem that we need to use, and uh, you need p bigger than 2. But it, it's, I, I, I believe it's, this is just a, a technicality, that someone brighter than us can get rid of that. OK. so. Um, so then we look at the evolution law, and uh, this is the problem, right? So on the surface of the film, you're solving this, this, this parabolic equation. In the film, you have elasticity, right? So just uh, equilibrium, elastic equilibrium, normal, natural boundary conditions on the surface of the film. Uh, this is the Dirichlet condition you started with. This, again, is zero is the amplitude of the mismatch. and. Um, uh, which tells you that you have these two competing uh, phenomena there, you assume periodicity. Oh, and again, and you start with, uh, your, with, a, with a certain initial profile. It's very, of course, you're going to gain very fast regularity here. So you start with H0 that it's, um, I don't know, H2 or something like that, and soon this becomes much smoother. There is something else that uh, in our work, our initial profile H0 needs to be at finite distance from the substrate. So basically, H0 is bigger than alpha, bigger than 0 all the time. So you need to have a buffer zone there, a safe zone. So if you start with a profile that it's touching the, the, the substrate at, at places, and why not, our analysis doesn't go through. So we don't know how to do that, OK? Um, OK, uh, OK, this is just, of course, the, uh, the, the element of, of uh, surface area. Uh, again, uh, many uh, people have worked on this, and I, I hope I didn't forget too many uh, credits. But um, uh, again, uh, as far as we know, our result was the first analytical result for these sharp interfaces with elasticity. Um, Okay, so here comes the Georgie. Uh, we, uh, we, we do this using, okay, so we have the gradient flow, and then you're going to use minimizing movements, right? So, so you, you just consider uh, basically this functional. So once you know what is the profile, you take the elastic equilibrium corresponding to that profile. Uh, so the evolution law is, uh, is what it is. It's a gradient flow. Uh, again, this was, goes back to Cannon Taylor that, that this was the law in 94. You're going to use minimizing movements. I will not bother you uh, with, uh, with, uh, with what they are because it was already Giuseppe Salvare, many others have already explained. But uh, so basically, you're uh, going to have a knowledge scheme, uh, scheme here. Uh, and um, uh, again, in the context of geometric flows, goes back to Armgen, Taylor, and, and Wang. And again, this work has been mentioned here before during this conference. Uh, the nature of your flow is going to depend on what kind of, uh, of uh, distance you consider here. In our case, you're going to take the h minus 1, uh, which is the natural one. And they, actually, if you look at Kahn and Taylor, uh, 
And even I'm going to tell you wrong. It's not explicitly said that it's H minus 1, but it is H minus 1. Once you go through that, you'll see it's H minus 1. OK, so there it is. So, so, so this is basically what I'm doing, right? I have, I have my energy, uh, which is elastic energy and surface energy density. Then I add my penalization. That's basically the time step here. Um, and this is the H minus 1 norm, right? So you solve this problem for H minus the previous one. Uh, normalized as it should be. Um, and so basically what I have is just H minus 1 norm. That's, that's essentially what it is. And um, OK, so, so you, have, you get a discrete version of the, of the evolution law. And you prove that then you do a linear interpolation uh, between this, uh, uh, between all these H1 to Hn, uh, right? At, uh, so you have at uh, time step capital N, you have H1 to Hn, do a linear interpolation, you get your next one, and then call it H uh, sub N, and then you prove that these H sub Ns do converge to something, and that something does satisfy. It's a solution of all problems. So, uh, and it's, uh, uh, okay, it's, it's rapidly becomes very smooth here, um, solves the PDE, uh, as it should be with the, with the, in, in the right weak sense. Uh, we can prove in 2D that the solution is unique. We don't know how to prove this in 3D. Uh, and again, if you talk with the physicists, if the solution is unique, they are not interested, basically, right? Uh, so, so that's a limitation. We only know how to do it in 2D. Um, we, we have many regularity results. So if you start in H3, uh, you see that you, you gain a lot of regularity, right? So you go, you bump up to H6 with your profile. Uh, and um, uh, there's also work by, uh, by, uh, by Nicola uh, Bonaccini and uh, Leon and Morini and many others. Uh, that followed up on this. In particular, they, they actually have um, a way of quantifying the, the, thickness, uh, the thickness of the film uh, after which flat is no longer uh, the equilibrium. I mean, you start getting these corrugated profiles. So, so, so there's a critical thickness after which this happens, and that's work by, by them. Um, and uh, now, uh, then, then we, we, we look into stability results, right? So, and we prove that, um, okay, provided you have nice conditions uh, to start with, uh, D, so say, suppose that you, uh, D, D is basically the flat configuration, right? I had fixed volume, I should have said, all this is done for fixed volume fraction D. So, so basically, Y equal to D would be the flat configuration. So if you start with your initial configuration close enough to the flat in some Sobol F norm, and again, you have fixed volume fraction, then actually uh, the solution exists for all times. And more than that, if you, if you wait long enough, it's going to try to become flat in the end. So if you start close to flat, eventually it's going to go to flat. Um, now, if in addition you look at the wolf set, and the wolf shape has been already mentioned here, so again, uh, in, in one line sentence, the wolf shape is the shape that minimizes the surface energy for fixed volume. Uh, so if the wolf shape has an horizontal facet, then actually, um, it's very interesting because you get Lyapunov stability. So again, if you start close enough to flat, then it's not that you have to wait a long, long time until it becomes close to flat. Actually, immediately it becomes very close to flat. So you have Lyapunov stability. Uh, OK. So, um, so now uh, with my last seven, 10 minutes or so that I have, I guess. No, that's OK. Uh, I think uh, I'm, I'm wrapping up my story here. <laughs> OK, so, but anyway, so, so, so now this is very exciting. OK, so, so we, we do all this. And then, and then we realize that there is an interesting phenomenon. 
Uh, and by the way, what I'm going to talk about here, it's something that we just submitted uh, very recently. So it's not, but it is, it's in the archive, it's in the PISA CVGMT, it's in the CNI, so uh, send me an email, it's, it's available. Um, and so, and so, so this is really, really fascinating. So, so, so now you have your film. Okay, you have your substrate. You have your film. Uh, these islands form the interesting shapes and all that. And and as you continue increasing a film, of course, these shapes continue to evolve. And as they evolve, well, you know, cusps form and cuts and all that. There's a huge energy building in the system, and something has to give. Uh, it's not going to be the elastic energy. Well, the film is doing what it can. So what happens is that these locations form at the bottom, and I may have a better picture than this. Let, let me move forward here. Yeah, kind of here. And then I move back. You see, you, see you have the islands, and these locations form at, at these cusps, at the bottom of these cusps. And then... Uh, it's a miracle. They, 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 they literally move down to the substrate, they sit on the substrate, and the film, boing, becomes flat again. So if you didn't know, and if you didn't have a cross-section, this is what you see in the end. You see flat film, except this is a perfect crystalline structure, and now you have defects sitting there. Uh, and that's where the energy is. Uh, so. Um, this is, really, uh, this is really very, very interesting. Uh, and so, okay, immediately you think, well, okay, so, so um, there's a lot of analysis to do here, right? So um, can we justify that, that, um, that actually um, these locations do form? Uh, can we prove that when they f form, they do go down and sit on the substrate? Um, can we prove that actually they like to be periodically uh, distributed on the substrate? And pictures and experiments do tell us that. We don't know how to prove this. Uh, it may be a PG thesis, but maybe too hard. But, um, but anyway, uh, the periodicity we don't know, but we have already some answers to some of the other questions. So that's how I'm going to wrap up my talk, and so let me really, um, um, give you uh, an overlook. Okay, you have several relevant um, references for this kind of work, but this is basically all, uh, <clears throat> well, either numerics or experimental work, so there's no, no analysis in here. Okay, so I'm not going to bother you with these locations for this audience, you know what they are. So uh, we are going to work basically with, with Volterra dislocations uh, here. And so, so what happens, uh, let's go back to our linearly isotropic elastic energy, simple. The U and lambda, the usual moduli. Uh, now, I have relaxed my system, right? Remember, when you relax your system, all you see is one value for the surface energy density, that of the film. Now, call it gamma. I have to put it twice gamma because if this is a singular set, it's when you have cusps. You have to count it twice, right? Because you came down, you go up, and then it collapses, so you have twice, right? That's the relaxed energy. Nothing particularly um, deep about that. And, uh, but now, to this, you you're going to add the fact that these locations may form. So, uh, well, so what happens is that now, uh, e of u is not going to be uh, grad u plus grad u transposed over 2. It's going to be a dislocation uh, strain field, but that's not curl free. It's, that's why you have a dislocation, right? You go around the loop and you have a gap there. So, so, so now h now is playing the role of your grad u, right? But now you can have di di uh, direct masses at, say, finitely many points with some weights. Uh, which we know are the Burgers vectors, right? Um, so uh, we also know that if I just plug this into the system, I get plus infinity, right? The energy goes like, uh, like logarithm of one to the radius as you go close to the dislocation. So there are basically two ways of solving this. One is remove a core uh, around its dislocation and work with that. And the other one, which is the one I'm going to, do, to use, is I'm going to mollify. 
I'm going to regularize um, in a small, in the neighborhood of each uh, dislocation core. Okay, um, so elastic energy outside the core and core energy. Uh, again, as I said, uh, you have to do it because outside the core, you're already getting pretty large as you get closer to, to, the, uh, to that. So many, many people have worked on, 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 on problems of this type, and I have many names in here. I, I, I'm afraid I cannot read them all, but uh, anyway, so, so, so there is credit when credit is due. I hope I, I, I've been, uh, uh, I've been um, uh, as exhaustive as possible there. Okay, so, so, so again, uh, take your, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take sigma. Sigma was basically this, uh, and I'm going to mollify it, right? So, so, so mollify it with your favorite uh, molly, uh, mollifier. And so instead of taking uh, E of U, I take the H plus H symmet plus H transposed over 2. Uh, and so... Um, and so what we are going to do here is the following. Suppose that you're given a finite number of dislocations, n. So you have, I give you a bag with n dislocations, and I ask you, what is the best place to display them on your system so that you minimize energy? It's an optimal design problem. Um, and so, uh, so that's why, is again, you are, you are working on fixed volume fraction of the film. I call it D. Uh, and the first interesting thing is that uh, if you now go through the same uh, process as we did before, the, the same exercise, we prove that even now with these locations, you have the same type of regularity result. Namely, except for finitely many cusps or cuts, the film is very nice. It's C1. I'm working linearly isotropic, basically. But you, uh, and again, it's C1 alpha. It's very nice. It's very smooth. The proof is much, much harder, and that's what took us a long time, but I, I won't go into that. Uh, basically, the, well, okay, just one word. Basically, there were a lot of truncations and, 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 and comparisons, of course, uh, uh, arguments that we used before, which now we can't, because when you have this location, basically, it's an obstacle, which is not going anywhere. You cannot touch it. Uh, you cannot cut these locations. You cannot move these locations. They are there, they are there to stay, and so basically they are very hard. Uh, there's a lot of rigidity there because of, of this. Okay, um, and then we proved that, uh, that if D, D is the volume of the film, if D is large enough, okay, forget it what it is, doesn't matter, but if D is bigger than a certain number, is you remember was the mismatch between the two lattices, or basically translated into the mismatch. Again, if it's large enough, it doesn't matter what it is, but if it's large enough, then indeed every minimizer will always have dislocations, and dislocations lie at the bottom. And, and that's exactly what we're trying to prove. So this is uh, something that we were uh, very happy with. Um, and, uh, and then again, uh, we prove that uh, uh, any uh, minimizer will have Non-trivial dislocations, again, provided you have the right thickness and, uh, and mismatch. Um, and uh, there are many open problems uh, here. Uh, we, I think, I believe we are only scratching the tip of the iceberg. Some of them are already mentioned. For example, uh, what if the substrate is exposed to start with? That is, H0 is 0 at some places. We don't know how to do that. Um, uh, for example, the non-graph case, suppose you have folds, right? You don't start with a graph. Or maybe you start with a graph, but you let the system evolve into a uh, non-graph case. Uh, other more general gradient flows, non-local molyne uh which was already mentioned in this conference. Uh, and actually, currently, with some of our postdocs and Giovanni Leoni, we are also considering uh, the presence of ad atoms uh, in the system. And with these locations, there's a whole world out there. Uh, again, in particular, periodicity would be very interesting to prove that. We don't know. So I will stop here. Thank you. Thanks to Irene for this beautiful talk, for the 10 minutes more of the coffee break we have. Uh, please, some questions, remarks, comments? Uh, 
Aim. I refer to the last part of your talk and the, the dislocations. It rang a bell, this infinite energy, when uh, you shrink the size of a ball. It rang a bell with what we did with uh, Betuel and Ella on uh, Ginsburg Landau. With and, the vortices. Uh, there, uh, so we have also the energy blows up in 2D. It's a 2D problem. The energy blows up. And uh, we introduce a renormalized energy by taking out the infinite part of the energy. And then we are left with this finite renormalized energy, which just depends on the location, just depends on the location of yes. the, uh, the singularities. And by minimizing that energy, which just depends on the location, we get the configuration. So my question is, well, first of all, do you have an estimate on the number of singularities or an exact number of singularities? And then could you do something similar to locate where uh, the singularity are by introducing a renormalized energy? Uh, so uh, uh, the first answer to the, I guess, the second part of your question, uh, uh, the number of these locations. Okay, so we have that fixed. That's another question that we have, we have not addressed. We started with N and we work with N all the time. So we assume that, again, that, that I'm given the liberty of using up to N these locations. Uh, so, so that is something that, of course, needs to be uh, addressed. Um, and also something else that would be interesting to know is whether uh, there is a threshold after which you really have a breakdown of the system, right? If you have too many dislocations, something has to, to go. Uh, with respect to the second, I have to confess, I didn't think about that. It's a wonderful suggestion. We'll, we'll have to see. We have to look back. I, oh, and the disclosure, the dislocations part is for 2D. For 2D. 2D, yeah, yeah. The dislocation yeah. part, we don't know, we didn't do that for 3D. Right. The first part, yes, the regularity, evolution, it's done for 3D. This is 2D, just as you work with Betuel, but it's a very good. Uh... Thanks. More questions? Oh. Umberto. Uh, my question is about the formation of islands. Now, the formation of disconnected islands is observed in sandpile models. And what is remarkable there is that the uh, collection of islands is formed in a finite time. So my question is, in this other setting, there are results in which one says that these islands are formed in a finite time. Yeah, we do. Yeah, yeah, it's finite. This is for finite time. You don't have to wait forever until this, uh, as long as you, as you, uh, as you um, go beyond a certain thickness of the film, immediately you have islands. You had a time horizon, right? You have some fixed time horizon at the beginning. I don't know. So, uh, in other words, if you work an, until a finite horizon time, Certainly, you get something in that finite time. Sure. So my question might be, must be reframed in the sense, do you know what happens if, a priori, you don't impose a finite time horizon, but you allow the process going on up to infinity? Uh, yeah, okay, so that, that, that I, yeah. And a posteriori, you find that it is finite. No, I, I understand the question. No, we didn't do that because, again, we work with a finite time horizon, so we didn't do that, yes, yeah. More? Thanks again.